saying it as on behalf of Ellie and it's on behalf of Joanna who is back in St Andrews which is in Scotland and there's a photograph of the three of us. <laughs> right, how does this work? Right, I'm going to actually start off with a little story. I've just realised there's a camera, I'm going to stand still. I, I do tend to wander around a bit. I'm going to start off with a little story about lighthouses. So this is a painting of the Bell Rock by Turner. Uh, and lighthouses, of course, are these iconic structures. I should have pointed out that not only do I work at St Andrews, I also work with SCAPE, which is Scottish Coastal Archaeology and the Problem of Erosion. And what I'm talking about here is purely about archaeological sites threatened by coastal erosion. So lighthouses, iconic things which are threatened by the waves. And this lighthouse has stood the test of time. It was built by the Lighthouse Stevensons. This is Robert Stevenson's lighthouse. But at the time that he was building that, he also started to construct this. This is the North Car Beacon. An amazing structure. You can see a little um, horizontal channel at the bottom. The sea would come in there. It would raise up that canister in the middle, which pushed up to the top, which would start ringing a bell. And there was clockwork there. And as the tide went out, the clockwork would allow the bell to carry on ringing. Um, and the way that he was constructing that on the top right hand side, you can see these beautiful sculptured stones. They fitted together like pieces of a jigsaw. He made this thing and he was using Pozzolano mortar. This was the strongest structure you could ever imagine. So we went out to have a look at it and this is what it looks like. So it looks completely different. The reason is, if we go to the next page of Stevenson's book, after eight years of trying to construct this lighthouse, he gave up. And the reason was he nearly got to the top of it and the sea knocked it all down. It kept knocking his lighthouse down. We don't have a chance against the sea, basically. If, if Robert Stevenson can't do it, we can't do it. So he made this thing instead out of iron and this thing is still standing there. But you can see the bottom courses of the lighthouse, of the beacon that he was trying to build. And there is the very hole that the sea was going to come in and was going to start ringing the bell. Right. So, if a structure like that can't make it, what chance do other structures have? Here we have a beautiful salt pan, 16th century building up in the highlands of Scotland, excavated as part of a community project, and here it is today, after the sea got to it. And this is the bottom kiln, uh, bottom a uh, lime kiln, bottom point lime kiln, that is huge. So a person would be about um, a third of the size of one of those um, arches. And this is it uh, now. So these structures are falling into the sea. They are being destroyed. How about our archaeological sites? These have no chance whatsoever. So there is my colleague Joanna. And from her shoulders, extending about two meters above her head to that line of shells at the top, is a prehistoric midden. And in the center of the picture there is a structure with a beautiful corbelled roof, and that is probably either Bronze Age or Neolithic. And here we see Ellie um, staring woefully at some remains up in Shetland, and we'll get onto those in a minute. So, coastal managers, of course, are very used to the problems affecting the coast, and they normally have three things that they would do. One, no active intervention, used to be called do nothing, but that sounds a little bit negative. Two, they can defend the line, or they can build a coastal defense, and three, managed retreat. But before we can even make those types of decisions, we need to know the assets that we have. We need to know what it is that we're protecting. And so Historic Scotland, and Historic Environment Scotland as they are now, uh, commissioned a series of surveys, coastal surveys, these are very similar to what Anthony was talking about that were happening in Wales, and from the mid-1990s uh, about 35% of the coast of Scotland has been surveyed, and as Murray said, the coast of Scotland is huge, it is the second largest in Europe, second only to Norway. Okay, 12,000 sites were recorded in a very narrow 100 meter strip from the coast edge, of which 4,000 had uh, recommendations for some work to happen at them. So there's a huge number of sites. So you have to start prioritizing. You have to prioritize, you need to know where to spend your money. And so we work with Historic Environment Scotland and with local authorities around the country. And we came up with a very simple uh, equation. And this was based purely on the data that was collected from the surveys. But we looked at the significance of the site and we looked at its vulnerability. You times them together and you come up with some form of a priority. Uh, if you want to hear about this in more detail, please go along to this fantastic session where I know that also you're going to see Marcy and you're going to see Tom and Phoebe K again. Uh, 297, go and see Ellie who will be talking about this on Saturday. So, as I said, no active intervention is one possibility, but as heritage managers, we have to recognize that 
If we have an archaeological site and we decide to do nothing, that should be a conscious decision. Because if we don't actually do anything, but we don't consider the archaeological site, we are consigning it to the sea. The second option is to defend the line. And this is a photograph of the castle at St Andrews, very close and just down the road from where we work. And everything that is above the beach is a Victorian coastal defence. So this is one of the first times uh, in Scotland that money was spent to defend a historic site. And I'm sure many of you will recognise this. This is Scara Bray, the World Heritage Site up in Orkney. And there at the top you can see uh, Scara Bray, but you can also see one of the problems that we have with building coastal defences. The sea comes up, it causes erosion all around it. It especially hits the edges of the coastal defence, which means that you have to have lots of money to be able to repair the defence and in order to extend the defence. And in this case, this is historic Scotland that is uh, defending their own monument here, but this is costing a lot of money. If you don't pay for the repairs to your coastal defence, this will happen. This is at Weems, and here you can see the sea has undermined. Uh, you're looking at the foundations, the sea has undermined them. The sea comes underneath that sea wall. That wall was actually built to defend that water pipe, so the water pipe is completely smashed up. The archaeological deposits that the wa water pipe cut through are going, and you can also see in the background the cliff where the Weems caves are, and I'll be talking about the caves in a minute. Our third option is managed retreat. So, I'm now going back to lighthouses again because I love this picture. Um, this, as Marcy will recognise, is Cape Hatteras over in North Carolina. And you can see to start with, National Park Service were trying to defend the area by building these groins. They were trying to get a build up of sand. Okay, that wasn't working. And then a state law was passed which had stopped them from building any more groins, which meant they decided to do this. The USA's tallest lighthouse on the move, it went from by the sea to this new location there. Okay, and this is how they did it. They jacked it up onto a railway and they just took it across the land. Absolutely genius. The same thing was happening in 1999 in the UK as well. This is over at Beachy Head, another lighthouse, and you can see its original position right on the cliff edge. But this is happening all the time. This is Nantucket, 2007. And here we see the Gay Head Cliffs over in Massachusetts. This is just a couple of years ago. So it is possible to move these structures, but of course it costs a huge amount of money. So I'm now going to finish off with a few examples from the, our Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk project. This was a project which was um, funded by a range of sponsors uh, and we have been working with communities. Ellie will talk about our shore update stage, but we've also been looking at doing a series of shore dig projects. So we've been working with people all around the coast looking for imaginative ways of dealing with heritage and so this is a preservation in situ thing and what I'm trying to say is we don't really have a chance with some of these sites we're not going to be able to preserve them we can't build walls around them so we have to think of other imaginative ways of dealing with sites which are being threatened now at this moment and so we go to the relocation option here is a site up in Shetland. This is a Bronze Age burnt mound. Uh, hot stones were pushed down that passageway into the tank, into the sunken bath, which is at the far end of the picture, just on the coast edge, which was filled with water. The water would then boil, and we have no idea why exactly they were doing that. I'm sure Anthony might have some ideas, because you've got loads in Ireland. Um, what we did here was we numbered up every single one of the stones, and then members of the local community helped us to hoik these stones out. And there's Lerwick in the background. This is on the island of Bressa. They loaded them up into their tractors, drove them across the island, and we went from this. This was, was giving me a heart attack while this was going on, but we went from that to that in about four weeks. So we completely moved the structure and we put it next to the Heritage Centre. And inside the Heritage Centre there is a display explaining why we did it, explaining about the site. That site has now been preserved. People can go and visit it and they can also go and learn about preservation of sites. We can undertake surveys. So this is a ship's graveyard over on the Clyde. Uh, and here it contains a, a fantastic array of different sorts of boats, including that which is the oldest surviving diving bell barge we think in the world uh, and there we've been working with members of the local community we've been mapping we've been drawing we've been teaching them how to record all of the different structures and using a range of different survey techniques sampling and excavation I'm just showing you these pictures just to show you that community work can actually be quite good fun this is James the fourth's harbour that we're looking for here <laughs> uh, doing some coring work 
Uh, we're hoping to, we're going to go back there next month to try and find if we've got the harbour. Here we have that, that site that I showed you up in Shetland in the first place. Uh, and what happened here, this site was uncovered in a storm, but we think that the site had already been half sectioned in the past and then covered up again. And what we're looking at there is a brock. And so on the far side, on the, on the left hand side of the picture, you can see the outer wall, the huge outer wall of the brock. And if you don't know what a brock is, this is the brock of Musa, which has been superimposed upon it, a dry stone Iron Age tower. Uh, and these sites are very, very rare. You very rarely get the chance to go and excavate one. But because we had the section, it meant that we were able to take samples all the way down. And here you can see us doing OSL dating as well. So we were able to take OSL dates from the top, from within, and from underneath the structure to try and get a very good idea of the chronology of Iron Age Brock building. Now we've nipped down to Orkney again, and this is another one of these um, burnt mound sites. So again, one of these places where the hot stones were put into the, the tank. The tank is the rectangular thing in the center of the picture. But up at the top of that, you can see a horseshoe thing. That is a well. And here is myself down this well. This is a Bronze Age well, beautifully constructed, three meters deep, made of um, dry stone walling. But within it, we had this amazing assemblage of environmental remains, beetles, seeds, shells, and all of the rest of it, which is giving us an insight not only into the Bronze Age, but when we excavated further, we actually found next to it a Neolithic well as well, which is fairly unprecedented, again, with fantastic organic remains. So this is a site which was being destroyed. The sea was washing over it. There was no chance for this site, but it still contained valuable information in the vein of do not, as we've just heard from Tom. We've been undertaking digital recording. So we've tried everything. We have cameras on long poles. We have cameras on kites. We use hexacopters. We, use, uh, we have a fantastic group of pilots who have volunteered their time and they fly around the coast and they take photographs of us. So this is very similar to what Anthony was talking about, but we, this is on a community level, but this is the same sort of idea. And I'm sure all of you can enthuse your own local communities, especially if you have some pilots who are interested in this kind of stuff. We use that to make these uh, structure for motion 3D models. So this is the Weems Caves with the Macduff's Castle in the middle at the top. Again, as Anthony was talking about, we've been doing laser scanning here. So we've been making these very uh, high resolution uh, images. And the Weems Caves contain these fantastic Pictish carvings, these Iron Age carvings, of which you can see one up there in the top right. That is Thor, his hammer and his goat. And once you have the laser scans, it gives you the chance to actually start working out some management options. So here you can see Macduff's castle and below that you can see the, the cave and there was a fear at one point that the castle may collapse into the cave, but that is helping uh, managers, including from Historic Environment Scotland, to come up with solutions as to, to what to do with sites like that. The local community have been doing reflectance transformation imaging. Here the camera stays still and the light source moves and you take a number of photographs uh, and then you stitch them all together on software, which is free and open source. And this is a leaping salmon, a Pictish leaping salmon. And once you've stitched all of these images together, you can put them onto a website. And as you move your mouse, it's as if you are shining a torch on the image. This is easy, it is free, and it's something that communities can learn to do very, very quickly. We've also run a series of local and oral history projects. Uh, so over at New Shot, where I showed you the um, boat graveyard, we have a series of schooners and local research showed us uh, images of the dock that they came from originally and why they are there. And they are there because there was this huge fire in 1914. And that is actually one of the burnt schooners that we have got over at New Shot. Over at Weems again, the community were um, sharing with us their images which show that the problems at the coast, these huge waves which have been coming in, have been happening for ages. And they've brought in photographs of destroyed buildings and all sorts of stuff. We also have video projects as well. So we've been working with communities. And this is down at Wig Bay, Dumfries and Galloway, where there is a big uh, air base from the Second World War. And we worked with excluded <coughs> children from uh, a local center. And we gave them the cameras and we got them to go out. And we asked them to interview people who had been at the airbase when they were children and get them to share memories. So the guy who's being interviewed there is the guy on the bicycle here. And the kids themselves made the, the, the films and it got them thinking about climate change. It got them thinking about coastal processes and got them thinking about history. I mean, here's one of the photographs of, uh, uh, that our local group of flyers uh, took. This is Eyemouth. And you can see here an English fort. 
and you can see a French fort here. These are from the Tudor periods. This is when Henry VIII decided to go and invade Scotland so that uh, his son could marry the uh, Scottish young Mary Queen of Scots. Didn't work. She married the Frenchman and they came in and built that fort. The local group, however, were very passionate about this eroding promontory, and so they got together and they have been working on interpretation projects. They've managed to get displays in their museum and gallery, but also they got an artist to go and make this fantastic reconstruction. They've turned this into a board. Historic Scotland uh, came in and helped them to design the board, and that is now on the coastal path up in Eyemouth. So I'm hoping that I've showed you a few ways that perhaps we can approach this problem of climate change and loss of sites from coastal erosion. Thank you very much.